Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm sorry, you all can do better than that. I said, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yes, yes, yes. So good to be back home. So good to be back home. My name is Jermaine Pearson, and I'm a 2016 Candler alumnus. Thanks you so much, uh, Reverend Lisa, for inviting me. I really do appreciate this opportunity. You don't know how much this means to me. Uh, I had a vision that I would be preaching uh, in canon. Uh, and it's funny how everything plays out. I'm going to tell you about that a little bit later. Um, to to my, my big little brother, Mari, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and voices, you all sound amazing. You still sound amazing. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but grad school is very stressful, right? Uh, school is very stressful. And sometimes you need uh, to get away from life, right? So I ended up joining uh, Voices uh, because I just need to get away from Candler at one point. And they welcomed their arms to this graduate student. And I sang with them for about two years. Every Friday, I would come to rehearsal. Uh, so it's just a blessing to see um, my people. I'm so glad you all are still here doing the work and sounding amazing. Can we give them a hand, you all? So I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going, I, I like to have conversations. Is that OK? You know, I don't have a manuscript today. I just want to speak from my heart. Is that cool? And I'm going to let you all know, I'm, I come from a Baptist background, OK? So I can be a little bit long-winded, right? But they already gave me the protocol, okay? They're going to tug on my coattail if I go over 20 minutes. So I promise you, I'm going to stay on task and I'm going to set my time. Is that okay? So I won't go overboard. Um, but yes, let's just pray. Um, dear God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be here, uh, gathered in this space, Canon Chapel, God. We thank you for the beloved community. And now, God, I ask that you use me uh, to be a vessel to your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So my sermon topic today is called Finish the Race. Finish the Race. Uh, so as you all can see, um, I love track and field, all right? Uh, do you all watch the Summer Olympics? I, I love Olympics. And my favorite races is track and field. And not just track and field, but it's usually the relay races, right? And the relay races are usually at the end of the Olympics, right? So that means all the people who have run their races, you know, they won golds and silvers or whatever, the best and the brightest come together to run relays. And so my favorite relay race is the women's four by 100. And I don't know if you all know that there's this history between the US women's track and field team and Jamaica track and field team. They tend to go back and forth uh, when it comes to the gold medals. So 
In 2012, I think it was in, 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 in London, the women, U.S. women, they broke a world record by winning this uh, 4 by 100 relay. So in 2016, there was much pressure on the U.S. women's team to win. And as you can see, we saw the video, we saw it twice uh, due to the sound, but that's okay. Um, it was actually good watching it without sound just to figure out what was happening. So I'll just recap what happened. Uh, so they were favored to win, and this is the first round, and Allison Felix is running. Now, mind you, Alex, uh, Allison Felix is the most decorated uh, track and field runner of our time. Uh, and so as she was running, there's this Brazilian woman on the side of her who encroaches upon her lane. Now, you may not have seen that, but this is what happens. And so in a desperate attempt, she throws the baton. Did y'all say she just kind of tossed it like, oh, catch it, please? And she didn't catch it. And so what happened? Um, English Gardner, she drops the baton. And you can see the frustration on Allison's face, right? She's like, what happened, right? And English is upset. And they go back, and y'all don't see this because it's kind of pieced together. They go back and pick up the baton and finish the race. And the thing about it is, everybody else, all the teams have done, they, they, they've finished their race, they've done, they already got their rankings, but they know in track and field, uh, you cannot contest something unless you pick up the baton and finish the race. And when I saw this, I, this spoke to me. When I tell y'all this thing spoke to me, uh, so many of us are in races for our lives. We are running for our lives. And the reason why I showed this video is one, uh, because it is the last week of Black History Month, and I want to show black excellence uh, with the women's track and field, but also want you all to see what it's like to come overcome adversary. adversary. And this is a prime example of individuals overcoming adversary, uh, adversary, adversity and picking up their batons and running their races. We are in the race for our lives. And some of us are on short journeys and some of us are on longer journeys, right? Some of us are running a sprint of 100 meters, but many of us, whatever journey is that you're on, you may be running a marathon. Who knows, right? Uh, but regardless of what journey that you're on, I promise you, you will experience some adversity, some moments of self-doubt doubt when you feel as if you can't make it or you can't do it. You're going to experience some challenges, and you might even experience defeat where you will actually drop your baton. But God is saying, pick up your baton and finish the race. We're all running for something. How many students do we have here? Hey, Amen. Oh, wow. All right. So your race is school right now, probably, right? We got some older adults that's probably working. Who, who's working full time? Who knows what that's like? Whew, that's a whole other journey, isn't it? Yeah, right? So you're running your own race. So whether you're trying to finish a degree or trying to get settled in your career, or start your own business, or maybe you might be the only person of your kind in that particular space, you're running for something. And many times, life can feel like an uphill battle, an uphill journey. And it seems like whenever you take one step forward, somebody always comes and encroaches upon your lane and makes you drop your baton and you take two steps backwards. As we move to the biblical text today, we have someone in our text, Paul, who has a tendency to drop his baton. How many of y'all know the story about Paul, right? Yeah, so I'm going to give you a little bit of history about Paul. And I have, I have a love-hate relationship with Paul. I do. Some of the stuff he says in the, in the New Testament is like, oh, I can't get with that. But some stuff he says preaches to me. I'm like, yes, preach, Paul, preach. And so Paul... Uh, and I love the book of Acts is because it chronicles the early Christian church as well as the leaders of the Christian church. So I love, I love the book of Acts, and I love preaching from the book of Acts. And so Paul, for those who don't know, Paul used to be uh, a persecutor of Christians, and then he had this Christ moment where he experienced Jesus for himself, and he ended up becoming persecuted. And so when he was on fire, he was really on fire. Paul did everything to the extreme. He was killing Christians uh, because it went against customs and the laws of his time. But then he had this conversion moment. And then he became the one that was persecuted. And so from then on, we go through the different uh, the texts, and you can see that he experienced many hardships and trials and tribulations along this journey. So prior to us getting to chapter 20, Paul has been stoned and left for dead, stripped naked and beat in front of everybody in public. He's been jailed a couple of times. So this is the story of Paul. He is experiencing much heartache and, and hardships, right? And he's doing this because he's speaking on behalf of Jesus. He's spreading the message of Jesus Christ. 
Have you ever experienced some times where you felt like you were doing what you were supposed to do and it just felt like you just kept getting beat down over and over? That's what is going on with Paul. He's experienced some major setbacks, but he continues to have the mentality that he has to finish his race. So honestly, Paul, when he gets to this point in chapter 20, he's speaking to the church in Ephesus. And he's been visiting many different churches. Uh, and this is actually his swan song. He believes that this is going to be the last time that um, he, he talks to this community, addresses this community. Um, and he feels as if like he may be dying. He doesn't know what's going to happen. So I'm going to offer three points uh, to walk us through this text to what happens when we are in a race and we don't know what to do. So the first point I want to offer, when you are going through your race or when you're about to start a race, it is normal to experience much fear before starting your journey. It is normal to experience much fear before you start your journey. Now, I know most preachers will like, preachers be like, oh, you can't, you can't have fear and faith. But here's the thing. Yes, you can. Now, it depends on what you do with, with that fear, right? And let me tell you what, so what Paul says, verse 22, And now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. Paul is scared. He doesn't know what's going to happen. Like, have you ever, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to do this, God. I, I'm trusting you. Paul is scared. How many of us, we deal with anxiety. I talk to so many students on a daily basis and how much fear and anxiety they deal with because they don't know what's going to happen. But God is saying, I got you, right? I'm the one that called you to this. And if I called you to this, I can get you through this, right? So Paul is nervous. And mind you, he is a leader. He is on fire. He's bold. And all the things that he's experienced, but Paul is still very much so scared. It's okay to have fear. Now, what happens is some people do two things. When they encounter a big task at hand, they get scared and they say, you know what? I can't do this. I'm good. I'm going to tap out. But then there are others who will take that fear and turn it into faith and lean on to God and be like, I can do this. So you can figure out what you're going to do. Are you going to have fear and tap out or are you going to have faith and go forward? I love this, this, this piece right here. Paul is his true, authentic self. And if you listen to the scriptures, he's nervous, but he is still going to do what God has called him to do. You have to tackle the task. And when you tackle the task, you can move forward and get to the other side. Verse 23 reads, I only, knew, only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are uh, that, that I'm facing. This is um, interesting. My point that I want to offer you is while you're running your race, God will give you wisdom to run the race. Uh, how many times have you ever encountered someone and you can't really explain it, but your spirit just couldn't connect with them? And he's like, I don't know what it is. There's something about them. My, my spirit just don't sit right with them. My grandma used to say, oh, I don't know about that person, so-and-so, so-and-so. My spirit just don't connect with them. But, you know, my grandma, she was wise, and she had some wisdom, right? And so it's something we can pick up on spirits when we know someone is not what we need in our lives. And those people, we have to be careful what we share our information about, right? We have to be careful what we tell others about ourselves because individuals will take that information and try to use that and turn that against you. So you have to be careful. You can't share everything with everyone, and you have to have wisdom and discernment while going through your race, because I guarantee you there will be hardships and everybody is not going to be on your team. You have to be careful who you put in your circle of people. I, um, as I look back over my life, I realize that because I didn't have a father figure, I would often look for mentors. Uh, and God has placed some great people in my life over the years. And Mari is one of them and some people in L.A. And I've had tremendous uh, men and women kind of take the place and be surrogate parents for me. But it got to a point in my own journey where I couldn't rely on any mentors. It got to a point in my own journey where I couldn't call my mama for advice because God was taking me to a place that no one else had ever been to. And so for me, I had to tap into this own discernment and wisdom that God had given me. And I was going through some stuff, but nobody could help me. It was something I had to do. God had to deal with me myself. So as I was going through these issues, I had to tap into my own discernment and lean on to the wisdom that God was giving me to help me run this race because no one else could help me do it. So oftentimes when we're running a race, we have coaches, right? 
And God is saying, you know what? (laughs) The only coach you need is the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and direct you for what God is calling you to do. I think about times where um, I used to sit over in a choir and people would not know I would be singing, but I would be so low trying to figure out what's going to happen next. Uh, and so I'm so thankful that I'm here because God has tremendously, tremendously changed my life uh, around. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that later. But I want to get to my last point. The race that you are running is not about yourself, but it's for others. The race that you are running is not about yourself, but it's for others. Verse 24, Paul says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. We're all fighting and running for something. Right? My cause is different from your cause, and your cause may be different from your neighbor's cause. We have social justice issues here in the United States and across the, mirror, across the world. Um, and we have to understand our purpose and why we created it. The reason why God gifted you with those gifts and talents is because God wants you to use those gifts to help others. Right? And you have to stay in your own lane because everybody's race is different. Don't compare yourself to your brother or your sister. Don't compare yourself to the person that's an engineer person at Georgia Tech. You know, you have to run your own race, right, and do what God has called you to do. And it's difficult at times, especially in the world of social media, where people are quick to flash pictures of how they're traveling and how they're doing this and how you're doing that. And you may be sitting up in your, your dorm room broke and don't know where your next meal is going to come from because you're out of swipes, right? I know, about, I know about that ministry. I know about that. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. yeah, right? But you have to run your own race, right? Others are maybe fighting to uh, dismantle white supremacy and end racism. Some people are fighting systems of oppression and trying to keep families, immigrant families together. Some people are trying to work when it comes to prison reform. And when it comes to the sex trafficking, it's so many issues, right? But it's, it's room for everyone and those issues and those causes. But you have to run your own race. You can't worry about anybody else, all right? It's no coincidence that you are here, that you're in this space, that you are measuring what you're measuring. It's no coincidence that you have gone and graduated and pursuing the career that you are pursuing. And it may not be making a lot of money, but guess what? That's what God has called you to, right? So you have to stay and run your own race. And Paul, Paul, like I said, this was his swan song, right? Paul thinks that he is going to die. He doesn't know what is going to happen. He doesn't know. But I come to let you know, Paul lives on. He makes it through Jerusalem. Now, he does get attacked, and he goes through many other things as well. But Paul makes it through Jerusalem, and he does not die in Jerusalem. He goes on and on, and he tries to go to Rome to to defend his faith again. The good thing about this message is, I think about Paul's journey. Yeah, and maybe you all know, maybe you don't know, but Paul does end up dying. But the thing is, his legacy lives on, right? It lives on through the the scriptures that we read. I don't know if when he was writing those letters to the different churches, I don't know if he knew that it would be part of the canon of our Bible. But what he did and what God instructed him to do lives on. And from now, we have a history of Christianity, the foundations, and now it's teaching us how to be Christ-like and uh, be witnesses for Jesus Christ. So the legacy and the work that you're doing now lives on. It's not just for you, but it's for those who are coming after you. Paul makes it to Jerusalem and he makes it out. He visits more people and he completes his task at hand. What is your task? What is it that God is calling you to do? What has God called you to do? What race have you started and you haven't finished? Where have you dropped the baton? For me, um, when I say it's kind of nostalgic to be here, nostalgic to be here, um, I knew a lot of people while I was here at Emory as a grad student, but I struggled academically. And no one would have ever known that I was on academic probation every other semester. Uh, And I had a reputation of, you know, having it all together on the outside. But inside, I was messed up, and I was worried, I was stressed out, deal with anxiety, a little bit of depression. Um, and it was rough, y'all. It was rough. 
And literally, literally, my, my professors and friends had to drag me across the finish line. And mind you, I had 22 hours my last semester here at Cantler, which was crazy. But I'm like, I'm not coming back. This is my last semester. I don't care what I got to do. I'm getting up out this place. I'm just being honest, right? <laughs> I was tired. I was weary, and I didn't understand now. Here, I have a close group of friends, and my friends had gotten into some masters and PhD programs at Columbia and in, uh, at uh, Northwestern. I have individuals who got good jobs with benefits, as my, my grandparents would say, right here on campus. Uh, and nobody would hire me. Nobody would hire me after all the work that I had been doing around Emory's campus and even Atlanta, nobody would offer me a job. So him, I quit my full-time job in Los Angeles, went to school full-time, borrowed from my 401k to do this thing that God told me to do. And here I am, graduated, barely graduated, but graduated nonetheless, and did not have a job. And it did not make any sense at all. And so many days, I wanted to tap out and quit. I wanted to tap out and quit. And I ended up Ubering, driving for Uber full time. Here I am with two master's degrees from some prestigious institutions, and I'm driving for Uber full time in, in Atlanta, in the Virginia Highland area where people are throwing up in my car at 11 p.m. at night. And it just did not make sense. And so I was trying to compare myself, like, God, what did I do wrong? My friends got jobs, I got these internships, I got PhD programs, I got these jobs, great preachers and stuff, and nothing is coming for me. And God is saying, stay in your lane and worry about your own race. And so what I do, I went home. I moved back home that fall. And I moved to the place where I grew up to. So here I am back home in the city of Chicago, living in the same room with my parents, uh, in the room that I grew up with my parents when I was in high school. Now mind you, I'm 30 something years old, y'all, grown 30 year old, something moving back home. My ego was like low. And the first week there, I applied for a job around the area. And I was like, let me just throw this application in. And you know, she called me back the next day. Uh, and this was at Loyola. She called me back the next day. And lo and behold, I ended up getting offered a job like two weeks later. So I was six months unemployed and then got a job off in two weeks. I was at Loyola for literally six months when I saw the job at Brown University come open, I said, you know what, this is an interesting position. Let me just throw my name in the hat. I threw my name in the hat and literally a month later, I had a verbal offer and I picked up and I moved from Chicago to Providence, Rhode Island within two weeks. So I stand before you as the proud chaplain at Brown University, but when I tell people, they say, what? Oh, wow, especially when I run into some old professors, because they, they know me from the struggling Jermaine, right? <laughs> Who can pass class, right? <laughs> and now I'm their colleagues, right? It's, it's different, and they're like, what? I say, yeah, uh-huh, but that's all God. And so it's nothing but God, by the grace of God, that I'm here preaching in this space. So the vision I had of preaching at, at Canon didn't come to fruition three years ago, but it came to, it's coming to fruition now. So I want to say, and many times I want to just drop the baton. I did. Like, mentally I quit. And I said, you know, I'm not coming back. I'm ready to go. I can't do this. And I know some of y'all may be feeling like that right now. School is hard. Life is hard, right? Life is hard. And you have to deal with the unexpected. No one prepares for death of a loved one. No one prepares of getting an overdraft fee. No one prepares of just small stuff like that you deal with on a daily basis. But it's hard. But God is saying, finish the race. Pick up your baton and finish the race. I know it's hard. I'm struggling right now. I right, pick up your baton, finish the race. But, but I don't know what's going to happen after graduation. I don't know what's going to happen either. But guess what? Pick up your baton and finish the race. But I don't have any money and I have these big dreams. I, yeah, I know. Pick up your baton and finish the race. The thing about this is, we saw the relay race, right? The women, they contested, right? And after they contested, they saw that they dropped the baton, but it wasn't their fault, right? But somebody had the wherewithal, they had the wisdom to go back and say, you know what? This is not right. 
and they won. So here's the thing. The women, the women's, I'll be honest with you, the U.S. women were always kind of favored to win, right? They were favored to win. They just had to pick up their baton and finish the race. So after they did the rerun, guess what? They won a gold medal, just in case you don't know. God is saying, look, I've already given you the victory. I've already given you the victory in this race that you're running, but you just got to get up, pick up your baton, and finish the race. Thank you.